Florida Mold Assessor License Exam Training Course. Welcome to the Florida Mold Assessor Exam Training by NAE RMC. For over 10 years, NAE RMC pronounced NERMAC has been providing the most comprehensive, up to date mold assessor training available, bar none, and it's always free. Florida Mold Assessor Exam Training, as the name implies, is a course to train new Florida mold assessors and to prepare them to take the NERMAC State Approved Florida Mold Assessor Licensing Exam. The training focuses on practical advice with consideration to Florida's humid climate, Florida's building practices, as well as Florida's mold law. Course Philosophy this course for mold assessor training differs from other courses on mold assessment in that it covers not only mold assessment but also mold remediation. A mold assessor cannot be expected to write a mold remediation protocol or oversee mold remediation work if they do not understand the ins and outs of mold remediation from a practical as well as a theoretical perspective. This home study course builds on the common sense and widely referenced mold and moisture assessment and mold remediation protocols recommended by the US EPA and the US Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA. We review the EPA and OSHA key concepts. However, the student is responsible on their own for reading and understanding the EPA mold remediation in schools and commercial buildings, and you will be tested on it. This course focuses on practical advice for implementing the EPA and OSHA recommendations. While the basis of EPA OSHA mold assessment and remediation recommendations are widely applicable, the EPA OSHA guidelines were written for facility managers and not the professional mold contractor. The professional mold contractor has tools and should have knowledge far beyond what a facility manager has. This course focuses on practical advice as to how a professional mold contractor would implement EPA and OSHA mold recommendations, including both technical and business-related concerns. Mold Remediation in Schools and Commercial Buildings was published in 2001 and is based on references works published in the 90s, and it has not been updated. The mold industry knowledge base has increased since then, and while the basics of the EPA recommendations are sound, aspects of the EPA recommendations can be improved upon. Our knowledge of mold and how to assess and remediate it has improved since the 90s. Let's use that knowledge to make mold remediation and assessment easier, safer, and less costly. That's a win-win for both mold contractors and their clients. Mold remediation in schools and commercial buildings has been strongly influenced by the earlier asbestos remediation procedures. Were one built long-term containments and one could not exhaust construction dust to the outside air. Mold contaminants, on the other hand, are typically temporary structures erected in minutes using spring-loaded poles with dusts exhausted outside and then taken down after the mold is removed, which on a typical job is just a few hours. For mold work, there is generally no need for expensive 6 mil plastic sheathing or permanent walk-in contaminants. Excuse me as specified by the EPA. New technologies are available since 2001 
that make mold remediation much easier, safer, and less costly. That's what we want to hear about. There are four recommended uh, prerequisites to this Florida Mold Assessor License Exam training course. Number one is mold and safety, respiratory protection. Number two is mold report writing. Number three is water, moisture intrusion, and mold. And number four is the mold standards of practice. The prerequisite courses are the state of Florida approved for 14 hours of continuing education credit. If you take and pass the online exams at the end of each of these four CE courses, you will receive continuing education credit applied to the first two year cycle of your mold license. The courses are available at no charge at www.free slash mold slash training dot org. The course exam and pricing. This training course for NERMAC Florida Mold Assessor License Exam is available at no charge. The NERMAC Florida Mold Assessor License Exam cost is $500 and includes a free question and answer session, exam prep from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. on the day of the exam. The exam is proctored and given in Fort Lauderdale or Orlando on the third Saturday of each month if there is no holiday and that's between 2 and 4 p.m. Contact Linda Rosen at area code 954-614-6860 or linda at moldfree.org for questions, scheduling, and to make a payment. Students will be able to take the test once on any particular exam date. However, the $500 exam fee covers up to three attempts at passing the exam. Most students will pass the exam the first time if they study the recommended material. The exam is open book, just like the state exam for general contractors. A passing score is 70%. There are no requirements to take any courses or read any material or take the exam prep review in order to sit for the exam. This is a Florida DBPR rule. However, we recommend that you do. If you do not pass, the exam is graded instantly. The exam software will provide you with a list of any questions that you did not get correct along with the correct answers. There will be a question and answer period after the exam to discuss any of the questions you answered incorrectly. Review the course material and questions that you missed, then schedule a time to retake the exam. You have up to three attempts to pass for the $500 fee. And please note, when you come to retake the exam, you will always see a different version of the exam. Required reading for this course. EPA mold remediation guidelines found at www.epa.gov forward slash mold. Download free of charge. Exam questions taken from booklet. When you finish this course, you should be able to identify conditions that can lead to mold growth, investigate the possibility of hidden mold when a suspect area is found, assess the amount of readily observable as well as hidden mold, including the AC and or ducting, classify a remediation job according to the EPA OSHA guidelines 
for the purpose of writing a remediation protocol, using the appropriate environmental controls for the job. Perform initial mold sampling as well as interpret post uh, remediation air samples to ensure the job site has not been left contaminated after mold remediation work. Uh, the training in this course consists of nine sections. Number one, understanding indoor mold growth. Number two, mold exposure and health. Number three, investigating hidden mold. Number four, assessing the extent of mold and moisture. Number five, interpreting mold sampling data. Number six, EPA OSHA mold standards where they may need expansion and or modification. Number seven, chemical free mold remediation. Number eight, explaining post remediation sampling results to your clients. Number nine, Florida mold law. The course goals. As a result of this online training, the student will be prepared to handle what the EPA and OSHA classify as small and medium sized mold remediation jobs that do not require building permanent walk and uh, containments with airlocks. The student will be prepared to perform such jobs without the use of chemicals that keep on killing. This course does not prepare the student for working in healthcare facilities or working on jobs with either asbestos or lead paint. Course limitations. Do not attempt to assess large complex jobs without sufficient experience. Do not attempt to assess remediation problems that involve black water. Black water includes any color water from the plumbing waste lines or from sewer lines. Black water includes all forms of groundwater flooding. Do not attempt to perform mold assessment in hospitals or other health care facilities. Do not attempt to perform intrusive, destructive inspections without sufficient construction knowledge or without client permission. Proper assessment of mold contaminated HVAC equipment cannot be performed by assessors alone. They must team with licensed AC contractors. Why? Because the thorough assessment of air handler components such as the coils, blower, and lining as well as supply and return air plenums requires air handler taken apart to check behind the coils and blower for mold, ducting opened to check for mold growth and or dirt and ducting and plenums. Such work can only be performed in conjunction with state licensed HVAC contractors. NERMAC certifications. Students that successfully complete the prerequisites and pass the exam will be provided with the following logos for use on business cards and websites. You have the certified green indoor air quality specialist and the council certified mold hygienist. Section 1, Understanding Indoor Mold Growth. The Objectives of Section 1. In Section 1, we explain when and where mold forms and how to prevent mold growth. At the conclusion of Section 1, you'll be able to identify conditions that can lead to mold, such as water leaks, condensation problems, and contaminated HVAC systems. Identify the equipment used for drying up water problems, 
and explain the ongoing relationship between water, humidity, and mold growth. The focus of an EPA OSHA mold assessment is find the moisture of earlier water damage and you will find the mold. Good advice. Mold and black water. You got mold? The first thing a mold assessor needs to consider with regard to mold growth as a result of a leak or a flood is to ask if the water that caused the mold growth was clean or was it not clean. If the mold was caused by unclean black water or sewage, then a water restoration contractor with experience dealing with sewage spills needs to be called in. Do not attempt to write a mold remediation protocol on mold resulting from black water. Black water contains pathogenic agents and is grossly unsanitary and dangerous. It includes toilet backflow from beyond the trap regardless of the color and includes water intrusion from groundwater flooding. Black water cleanup requires an experienced professional. Mold growth after a water event. According to the EPA and OSHA, water should be dried up within 48 hours to avoid mold growth. Typical molds that colonize water damaged buildings take 3 to 10 days to start to grow. Early colonizers such as some species of Penicillium, Pen, and Aspergillus asp, together called Pen asp, can start to colonize as early as 48 to 72 hours. Note that a building that had earlier water damage and mold growth may have latent or dormant mold hidden in the walls or ceiling cavities. The new water source now causes the mold to become active even if the water is dried up within 48 hours. Mold growth after a water event. According to the EPA and OSHA, later as soon as 7 days, but more typically starting from 7 to 12 days, comes Stachybotrys, the mold commonly called the black toxic mold. Stachybotrys grows well on cellulose materials like paper face on drywall. Stachy needs a great deal of water over a longer period of time as compared to penasp. Some exceptions are cabinets are often made from pressed wood which is highly water absorbent and often show growth of stacky with minimal water because they stay wet so long. And ceiling tiles are made from highly absorbent paper and often show growth of stacky with minimal water because they stay wet so long. Mold or mildew definition. Mold is a common term for filamentous fungi, often seen as a fuzzy growth formed on the surface of damp indoor materials. Mold growing outside is often called mildew. Mold growth can discolor materials and present potential health risks to humans. Mold needs water or humidity and food organic material such as wood or paper or fabric or surface dirt and dust on concrete, plastic, fiberglass, etc. to grow in indoor environments. Mold versus wood destroying fungi. Mold is a type of fungi but when a mold professional talks about fungi what they mean is fungi that is not mold. Mold grows on many substrates, but when it grows on wood, it grows on the surface of the wood. 
Mold causes discoloration of the wood surface by their pigmented spores and or mycelia, but they do not damage the wood structure. On the other hand, fungi such as wood rot, also called dry rot, grows deep into the soft wood and can actually destroy the wood. Mold spores and mold body definitions. This is what it looks like for a mold spore. Again, mold spore. It's the mold stalk body and the mold stalk body. Mold spores definition. Mold spores are the seeds that molds produce in order to propagate. The seeds are tiny, about the size of bacteria. Sizes range from 1.0 to 20 micron. A micron is one millionth of a meter. Seeds in the smaller size range less than 5 micron such as those produced by penicillium and aspergillus penasp are called respirable and lodged deeply in lung sacs called alveoli. Mold gases, MVOCs, definition. Growing molds produced uh, musty or earthy odors. The odors come from MVOCs, microbial volatile organic compounds, which is gases produced only by growing molds. Odors are not produced when mold is either dead or dormant. Latent is another word for dormant. HVAC definition. Heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. The HVAC system ventilates, cools, heats, and during cooling months removes humidity. Since the HVAC removes humidity, it is constantly wet inside. If the HVAC system is not clean of dust and dirt, both organic, the moisture in the system will always result in mold growth, not just on the cooling coils, but on the lining of the air passageways, ducting, and plenums. Mold in HVAC systems generally result in more of a health problem than mold hidden in walls since the HVA system distributes the mold spores along with mold toxins and allergens throughout the building. IEQ definition. The term indoor environmental quality, IEQ, refers to indoor pollutants including biological, chemical, or particulate pollutants and thermal conditions, temperature and humidity, as well as noise, light, and odor. The characteristics and conditions of HVAC systems and buildings strongly influence IEQ. Viable or non-viable spores definitions. Spores are classified as either viable or non-viable. Viable means alive and capable of growth, germination. Viable spores may be dormant, asleep, and waiting for proper conditions, which include temperature, water, and food. For example, the paper face of drywall. Non-viable means dead. All spores, whether dead or alive, can produce toxic and or allergic effects. However, viable spores are generally more irritating than non-viable dead spores 
as the viable spores can attempt to germinate in human sinuses, which result in the release by the spores of irritating chemicals as they attempt to put down roots. Mold Fragments Definition Mold is fragile, whether alive or dead. Moving air across the mold, which constantly occurs to mold growing in HVAC systems, produces mold fragments. The fragments may be produced in greater numbers than mold spores and may be more of a health concern than spores as fragments can become lodged in the small parts of the lung called alveoli. Fragments are invisible to standard mold sampling techniques. Mold growing in ACs or ducting are subjected to high rates of airflow and will produce copious amounts of mold fragments that are invisible to spore sampling. Mold glucans definition. Mold glucans are small pieces of mold cell walls and are not visible by standard mold sampling spore traps techniques. Glucans that may cause inflammation to the lungs and airways EPA. And glucans can affect the immune system when inhaled EPA. Mold growing in ACs or ducting are subjected to high rates of airflow and will produce copious amounts of mold cell wall fragments including glucans that again are invisible to spore sampling. Mold toxins definition. Not all molds produce toxins, but many common molds that result from water damage do produce toxins. Mold toxins are produced by molds to defend a mold's turf against competitors that may include other species of mold as well as bacteria. Penicillin is the most well-known mold toxin. It is toxic to bacteria but non-toxic to people although some people are allergic to penicillin because mold toxins are toxic to bacteria exposure to mold toxins can have a negative impact on good bacteria presiding in the gut resulting in the gut related illness called dysbiosis Mold toxins can affect the human respiratory system, especially penasp spores that are small and respirable. Respirable mold spores, less than 5 micron in size, lodge deep inside the lung and are hard to eliminate. The longer it takes to eliminate, the more toxins that are absorbed. Other mold toxins affect the brain. These toxins are called neurotoxins. Symptoms can include headaches, lack of concentration, fatigue, and others. Mycotoxin and neurotoxins definition. Mycotoxins are toxic substances produced by molds. Neurotoxins are toxic substances that affect the nervous system. Stachybotrys, the so-called black mold, is a dangerous mycotoxin neurotoxin producer. Stachy produces the neurotoxin trichothecene, which has been used as a biowarfare agent. Other molds including Fusarium and trichoderma also produce neurotoxins. Some penasp species, but not all, 
produce mycotoxins. Note that trichoderma is a neurotoxin producing small sized mold that is included with penasp spore counts. Mold toxins. On the one hand, toxins from penasp mold are less potent than stachybotrys toxins. However, penasp mold spores, when present, are generally at much, much higher levels in the air than stachybotrys spores and therefore will often be the cause of many health problems. Why is that so? Penasp is a dry mold and releases mold spores into the air much more readily than does stachybotrys, which is a slimy, sticky mold. Penasp, but not stachy, often colonizes AC and air ducts and therefore is easily aerosolized and readily transmitted throughout the facility. Understanding Mold Growth Review Here's uh, some test questions. The procedures for mold remediation are the same whether the water that caused the mold was from clean sources or from water contaminated with sewage black water. I'm going to say B false. Water that contains sewage is considered to be dangerous only if it is visibly dark in color. I'm going to say B false. Which of the following species of mold are early colonizers that can grow within 48 to 72 uh, after a water intrusion event? I'm going to say Aspergillus. Which of the following mold species is slower growing and requires large amounts of water? I'm going to say C. Stachybotrys. Mold can cause many adverse health effects in humans, but cannot degrade building materials. I'm going to say B. False. Which of the following statements are true? Check all that apply. I'm going to say A. Growing molds produce musty or earthy odors. It's not B. I'm going to say C. All molds, regardless of color, that can produce inbox. And I'm going to say D. HEPA air filters will not remove inbox odors. A micron is equal to one and one millionth of a meter. All mold species have the same potential to produce spores that lodge deeply in the lungs when inhaled. I'm going to say B, false. Which of the following is not a condition that affects mold growth? Well, we know that temperature affects mold growth. The season of the year can definitely affect it. Water definitely affects it. And of course, the food source. So I'm going to say E, all of the above can affect mold growth. Molds produce toxins during the metabolism process as a way to chemically break down their food, their food source. I'm going to say B, that's false. Which one of the following is not true? All molds produce toxins. That is not true. All Aspergillus and Penicillium species can produce mycotoxins. That is false. Mold spores range in size from 
1 to 20 microns. According to the EPA, water should be dried within 48 hours to avoid mold growth. Toxic and allergenic effects can result when viable, non-viable, dormant, and dead mold spores are inhaled. So that would be E, all of the above. Principles of drying, evaporation, open the windows if humidity is low outside or turn on the air conditioner or use fans. Uh, commercial specialty air movers, which is right here, or specialty air movers equipped to dry wall cavities and under cabinets, which is right here. Uh, mold requires either water or greater than 65% humidity to grow. Principles of drying. Dehumidification. When moisture is moving, being evaporated from materials, the moisture must be removed from the air. Use portable or central AC or by using dehumidifiers. Exhausting to the outside by opening windows if there is drier air outside also works well. Principles of drying. Temperature control. Evaporation and dehumidification are both enhanced by elevating temperature. Microorganism growth is temperature related. Optimum for mold growth is between 68 and 86 degrees. When it is warm there is significantly more mold growth than when the AC is on. Water extraction of excess water. Commercial water extraction equipment. Mopping, soaking up excess moisture, wet vac, etc. Extraction is a thousand times faster than evaporation. Drying can spread mold. Pressurizing wall cavities or using fans or blowers in water damaged buildings where mold growth has already started can spread mold. Using the AC to help dry when there is existing mold risks spreading mold and contaminating the AC. However, in many cases, the AC already needs cleaning. Cooler temperatures will reduce the growth of mold. Running the AC not only cools, but also dehumidifies and makes workers more efficient. Reduced humidity as a result of running the AC can help slow or eliminate the growth of mold. Moisture entry. Unsealed gaps between construction materials, stucco cracks in exterior, improper roof runoff or roof leaks, wind driven rain, poor drainage, dried or cracked or missing caulking around windows, leaks around penetrations and stucco from installing hurricane shutters without first caulking openings, leaks around lights or pipes penetrating stucco but not properly sealed or caulked, water where it is in contact with a porous solid can move through the solid due to attraction of the molecules of the liquid for those of the solid. Concrete slab, concrete block. Capillary rise of groundwater through footing and concrete wall affecting flooring and drywall and baseboards inside. 
relative humidity, moisture. If you add or remove moisture to air that is kept at a constant temperature, you will increase or decrease the relative humidity of the air. Mold requires either water or greater than 65% humidity to grow. If you raise or lower the temperature of air and keep the amount of moisture constant, you will decrease or increase the relative humidity of the air and increase or decrease the thirst of air for moisture. Mold requires either water or greater than 65% humidity to grow. Movement of moist, humid air. We're often concerned about unplanned airflow and the moisture it can bring in humid climates and seasons. Airflow will always be from high pressure to low pressure. What might cause pressure changes? Pressurized and depressurized wall cavities and plenums due to building heating or cooling. Pipe and electrical chassis connected to occupied spaces. Air leakage and outdoor mold. Most mold spores from outside that can be measured in the indoor air come from open windows or doors. The highest levels of outdoor mold spores found indoor are typically by the front door of a building. If the AC is equipped with a quality air filter, a MERV 9 or higher, and it is cooling, running frequently, or if the fan is on, the amount of outdoor mold in the indoor air is greatly reduced. Common HVAC air leaks. Air leaks around return air grills. Air leaks around air filters when the AC is in the basement, attic, garage, or any non-conditioned space. Leaky ducts in attics or crawl spaces. All very common problems that can result in mold contamination in the AC and a home, office, or school. It may not be noticeable in cooler and or dry seasons. Which of the following is not a method which can be used to help dry out a building? I'm going to say D, opening window on high humidity days. Which of the following is not equipment that should be used to dry a building? I'm going to say B, propane or kerosene space heaters. Evaporation and dehumidification are both enhanced by lowering the air temperature. That is false. The optimum temperature range for mold growth is 68 to 86 degrees. Which of the following are not places listed where capillary action can cause movement of water? That would be C through ceramic tiles. If you remove moisture from air that is kept at a constant temperature, you will D, lower relative humidity. If you raise the temperature of air and keep moisture content the same, you will A, lower the relative humidity. If you lower the temperature of air and keep the amount of moisture constant, you will raise the relative humidity of the air. That is true. Airflow always occurs from areas of high to low air pressure. 
That is true. Which of the following can lead to indoor air quality problems? Check all that apply. That would be A, leaky ducts and attics and crawl spaces, and B, improperly sized air filters. Common HVAC problems. Air leaks in AC closets. Ceiling or wall around AC pipes or electrical. Floor around AC pipes or electrical. Behind an inaccessible supply plenum. All very common problems that result in mold contamination in an AC closet. It may not be noticeable in cooler and or dry seasons. Their handler is located inside the house and has non-ducted return air, uh, no white box underneath. Return air comes through the louvered door and any openings in the closet will result in the AC pulling dirty wall cavity air into the home. Some indoor sources of moisture, bathing, cooking, laundry, respiration, plumbing leaks, condensation, AC closet air leaks, leaks in AC ducts, moist attic air leaks through recessed lights, moist attic air leaks around AC registers, seepage from outside, leaking windows or doors. Pressure differentials. Wind blowing into attic vents can pressurize attics, or afternoon sun can pressurize attic spaces as attics heat up. Most wall cavities are connected to attics, and attic pressurization can result in moisture, smells, mold spores entering wall cavities, entering home or office through openings around electrical plates, baseboards, entering home or office through unsealed, recessed ceiling lights, etc., bathroom, kitchen, dryer exhaust fans pulling moisture, smells, mold spores from walls, attics and basements. Vapor diffusion. Problems encountered due to moisture moving through the building envelope, crawl spaces, wall cavities, attics. Degree of diffusion is a function of vapor permeance of materials, the ability of materials to breathe. Newer homes in Florida use five foil brand insulation that keeps wetness on the furring strips from being transferred to the sheetrock, but it does not seal wall cavities and therefore allows the AC to dry out moisture in the exterior walls. Vapor diffusion wall cavity. Wallpaper on the other hand, on outside walls, keeps moisture inside of walls and can lead to mold growth. Humidity and condensation. Moisture behavior in a room is often controlled by surface temperature. Cool condensing surface. Cool metal surfaces of AC grills will condense water and if dirty or dusty, they will support mold growth. High humidity in the attic can leak into a home and condense on drywall around AC grills. Cool condensing surface. If supply cans under the grills are not properly sealed where they pass through the drywall. During moist summer months, moisture will condense on the outside of windows in an air-conditioned house. 
if during winter months moisture condenses on the insides of windows, watch for indoor mold growth. Improperly insulated attics can result in mold growth. Cold air conditioned air from the home or office cools the ceiling and the moist attic air condenses on wood and the ceiling drywall. Cool condensing surfaces in the attic above and results in mold growth. Moisture control in attics. Do not exhaust moisture, dryer vents or bathroom exhaust into the attic or ceiling plenums. Control moisture sources in the attic space such as cool condensing surfaces. Sealed attics with no attic vents. If there is a water leak, a sealed attic will quickly grow mold. A ventilated attic is more forgiving than a sealed attic in the event of a roof leak. Understanding mold growth. Question one. Home and office AEC systems are a common source of mold contamination. That is A, true. Number two, air leaks in an AC closet can occur. B, around AC pipes or electrical conduits in the wall, ceiling, or floor. Number three, HVAC air leakage problems can occur around return air grills that leak around edges because the drywall opening was overcut during construction, air filter slots when the air handler is located in a garage or attic, and leaking AC ducts in attics and crawl spaces. The answer would be D, all of the above. Number four, which of the following is not a source of indoor moisture? That would be D, some electronic devices. Number five, indicate which one or ones of the following are often associated with indoor air quality problems that originate from mold contaminated attic air. Check all that apply. Okay, that would be A, leaks and ducts. B, mold in unsealed AC closet. And C, smells from recessed lighting fixtures. Number six, bathroom, kitchen, and dryer exhaust fans can pull moisture, smells, or mold spores from walls, attics, and basements into the living space. That is A, true. Number seven, during winter months, if moisture is condensing on the inside of windows, watch for surface mold growth on the inside of window sills. That is A, true. Number eight, vinyl wallpaper on a perimeter wall in a hot, humid climate is a good strategy to prevent mold. That is B, false. Number nine, moist air from bathroom, kitchen, or dryer can be safely vented to the attic to prevent mold growth. That is B, false. Number 10, a sealed attic will be more prone to mold growth than a ventilated attic in the event of a roof leak. As A, true. Section one has been completed. In section one, we explained when and where mold forms and how to prevent mold growth.
We also introduced methods for drying up excessive water and warned about complications when the water source was unclean water. You should now be able to identify conditions that can lead to mold, such as water leaks or condensation or air leaks in and around HVAC systems. Identify typical equipment used for drying water problems and explain the ongoing relationship between water, humidity, condensation, and mold growth. And stay tuned because in our next section we start on section 2 Mold and Health.